Great. Well, thank you, everyone. It's uh, wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. It's wonderful to be back uh, in, the, in, in my old hood, or I guess my dad's old hood. My, my dad's office was uh, across the parking lot here in this building. So wonderful to be here. I'm pleased to be joined today by our host, uh, Dr. Mohammed Nanji, who is the president and the CEO of surgical centers, as well as the medical director here at the Rocky View Surgical Center in Calgary. Also with us, uh, us today is Dr. Francois Belanger, who is the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer with Alberta Health Services, AHS. Now, before I begin today's announcement, I want to acknowledge that today's, um, today marks the one year since Alberta first reported its first positive case of COVID-19. And this has been an incredibly difficult uh, year for every one of us. And of course, most of all, uh, the families who have uh, lost loved ones, including too many residents of our continuing care facilities throughout the province and five of the dedicated staff who care for those people. And we will keep them in our hearts. And as our government, we will honor them by working to make our continuing care system better and make it safer. The pandemic has brought loss for too many families. And earlier this winter, it seemed like the news was just kept on getting worse here in Alberta. It was tough on all Albertans. It was tough on our health system. It was tough on our government as we struggled every day with the balance between protecting lives and livelihoods. But things have changed. More than I think any of us could have guessed even a few weeks ago. The news is getting better today just as fast as it, as it uh, got worse a couple months ago. Just today we heard that a fourth vaccine has been approved, this one from Johnson & Johnson. Now we don't yet have a schedule for supply from the federal government in Ottawa, but we do know that even with the three current um, vaccines that have been approved previously by Health Canada, every Albertan who is an adult should be able to get a first dose by the end of June as I said yesterday. And this isn't just a light at the uh, end of the tunnel, it's the other side and we're going to be there this summer. Now of course there's no guarantee and I can't put a, an exact date on it and there's still a lot, lot of hard work for us to to get from here to there. For the staff in our ICUs and, and other units in our hospitals uh, who are still treating COVID patients, for the, the people doing thousands of vaccinations every day and for all of us in sticking with the restrictions to make sure that we put COVID behind us. But for all of that, the, uh, the picture has changed. So today I want to thank every Albertan working on the front lines from the hospitals and the continuing care facilities to grocery stores and beyond. I also want to take a moment to thank Dr. Hinshaw She's a, a trusted advisor, not just to me, but to the, the government and a, a source of reliable information and a voice of reassurance for all Albertans. And now I want to, to talk about the promise that we made Albertans before COVID. We promised better access to our publicly funded healthcare system, starting with shorter wait times for surgery. We said that every Albertan should get their surgery within what doctors call clinically acceptable lengths of time. Doctors have agreed on what the targets should be, but no province has ever met them. Not for all patients. But I'm here today to say that we are sticking with our promise that every Albertan will get their surgery within the agreed target by 2023. Now, this is a, a big challenge for us, made much bigger by the pandemic. And last spring, the health system was forced to postpone many scheduled surgeries to free up capacity for COVID patients. And the second wave forced postponements again in the fall and the winter. But this time we were better prepared to manage the demand on the hospitals and to reduce the disruption of scheduled surgeries throughout Alberta. So even as AHS was forced to make specific changes to, to free up capacity, they pressed ahead where they could. And they've worked in partnership with Covenant Health and chartered surgical facilities to minimize delays for patients and the backlog of postponed surgeries. Now, with Budget 21, we're committing funding to eliminate the pandemic backlog and ramp up further to reduce wait times. 
We're working toward the goal of treating every patient within a, as I said, what doctors call a clinically acceptable wait time by 2023. Through in increases in operating as well as, as capital funding, our health system will provide more than 55,000 additional surgeries in the next fiscal year starting April 1st. That's on top of the normal volume of about 290,000 surgeries that will be done this year. The work has already started with more surgeries being done in chartered surgical facilities and in specialized AHS and Covenant hospital units. And our partners in chartered surgical facilities began offering more surgeries to Albertans in December and will be ramping up those efforts in the coming months. More than 40 of these facilities already provide publicly funded surgeries under contract with AHS at no cost to the patient. These facilities have capacity in their operating rooms and can easily and safely offer more surgeries like cataract removals to reduce wait times. In fact, in December alone, chartered surgical facilities performed 40% more cataract surgeries than they did the previous December. And we're also reaching out for new chartered surgical facilities or those that aren't currently under contract with AHS. AHS will post requests for proposals this spring to move forward uh, with this work. And by 2023, this plan means that chartered surgical facilities will offer Albertans 90,000 surgeries each year, far more than the current 40,000 surgeries each year. And for its part, HS has worked with Covenant Health to create five specialized hospital units around the province dedicated to uh, surgical patients. And starting in January, these sites began ramping up to serve patients who need more complex inpatient or um, another way of describing it as overnight surgeries. These units are in Banff, Edson, Peace River, Innisfail and at Edmonton's Royal Alexandra Hospital as well. Now going forward, these sites will do more surgeries on weekends and evenings. Other hospitals across the province will also offer more surgeries depending on their COVID situation. But by allowing these five sites to focus on scheduled surgeries right now, we're reducing future postponements and decreasing the impact that COVID might have on patients. And we know that this may be hard for some families and patients to consider going to a, another community for, for surgery. We ask for your patience. We ask for your understanding. We don't want another spring slowdown where we have to postpone more scheduled surgeries, leading to delays in care for thousands of Albertans. This is a made in Alberta plan, the most aggressive of its kind in Canada. And it ensures that we have the beds, it ensures that we have the hospitals, and it ensures that we have the staff to look after COVID patients. At the same time, it provides more than 55,000 additional surgeries for a total in the next year of 345,000 surgeries this next year alone to patients as quickly as possible. And we're committed to a publicly funded healthcare system built around the needs of Albertans and their families, starting with these shorter wait times. That's our promise to Albertans and we're going to deliver on it. Thank you, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Belanger from AHS to provide some comments. Hello everyone and thank you Minister Chandro for inviting me to join today. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk about the work we'll be doing in partnership with Alberta Health to improve the wait times of Albertans waiting for surgical procedures in our province. We recognize surgical wait times have been top of mind and of significant concerns to Albertans, more so as we respond to the ongoing pandemic. 
We are dedicated to ensuring Albertans receive surgeries within clinically appropriate targets. And we're already working through the surgical backlog, recovering to pre-pandemic surgical activity levels, and focused on continuing on with our pre-pandemic plans to reduce wait times, as quality and timely care for Albertans is our top priority. As Minister Shandro mentioned, in spring 2020, we temporarily postponed non-urgent scheduled surgeries. While surgical activity was reduced by 60% during that time, it is important to note that Alberta Health Services continued to provide urgent and emergent surgeries to patients and Albertans continued to receive their life-saving surgeries. And they continued to receive those life-saving surgeries when they needed them. And on May 4th, we were able to resume scheduled surgeries. Approximately 25,000 surgeries were postponed between March 18th and May 4th, 2020, and during the summer and throughout the 2020 and 2021 fiscal year to date. Alberta Health Services surgical teams have been able to clear the March to April backlog and support surgical activity at about 89% of pre-COVID activity levels. All patients whose surgeries were postponed between March and May 2020 have since had the opportunity to get their surgery rebooked. This is a tremendous accomplishment given the demands of the responding to the pandemic and maintaining capacity within the health system. The resumption was a significant effort as the process for surgery for patients, staff and physicians changed considerably, including new workflows and new requirements for public health measures to ensure ongoing safety for our patients. Following this resumption, in November 2020, we experienced a second wave of COVID-19 cases, resulting in delayed scheduled surgical procedures in some sites across the province. As we now begin to come out of wave two of COVID-19, Alberta Health Services, along with Alberta Health, is working on various strategies, such as the focused surgical sites and expansion of chartered surgical facilities references, referenced by Minister Shandro. We continue to monitor the impact of these surgical delays and our surgical backlog as a result of wave two, services, wave two surgical services rejunction, reductions. To provide an understanding of chartered surgical facility marketplace availability, a request for expression of interest went live in January 2020 and closed in June 2020. In follow-up, Alberta Health Services is issuing two requests for proposals this spring to seek an expansion for procedures for chartered surgical facilities partners for ophthalmology and orthopedic surgeries that will help manage the increased surgical demands enhanced capacity in particularly high needs areas such as hip and knee surgeries in the long term. We already rely on our chartered surgical facilities partners to perform a number of surgical procedures. Of the 290,000 patients receiving surgeries in Alberta Health Service in Alberta, Alberta Health Services Acute Care Hospital provide about 85 percent or an estimated 260,000 of these surgeries and in 2020, approximately 15% or 44,000 publicly funded surgeries were provided in chartered surgical facilities through 51 contracts with AHS. Without these partnerships, as we are responding to the pandemic, our wait times would be longer for things like cataracts and orthopedic, orthopedic day surgery. What does this mean to Albertans? In contracting with chartered surgical facilities, our goal is to improve surgical wait times through improved access to service. This work is designed to increase access to surgeries across the province for Albertans, while balancing the healthcare system capacity need for the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic response. It's important to note that safety of patients and the safety of our staff and physicians remain, remains the utmost priority. Any increases in surgery activity will happen, providing it is safe and appropriate to do so. Following this expansion and recovery from the pandemic postponement, we will continue to move fully into the Alberta Surgical Initiative, which will have us continue to decrease wait lists so no patient is waiting longer than what is clinically recommended. We continue to work, to work towards a full recovery over the next year, ensuring that patients receive their surgery within clinically appropriate timeframes and eliminate the COVID-19 accumulated backlog. We're extremely grateful for the patients of all Albertans who had their surgeries delays as we took and continue to take 
necessary steps to ensure our healthcare system is prepared to respond to COVID-19 pandemic. Working in partnership with Alberta Health, we're moving towards making sure patients and family, families will receive a the surgery they need when they need it, according to clinically appropriate targets. This partnership with Alberta Health will help us achieve our goals to measure, to provide more surgeries for Albertans and maintain high quality care. Finally, I would like to thank all the teams at AHS who are working together with physicians to make this happen. We value all of you and your dedication to Albertans. Thank you again for having me today. I believe it will be Dr. Nanji who will say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the staff at this Rocky View Surgical Center, it is my proud privilege to welcome Minister Chandra and Dr. Belanger to come and visit us and give us their highlights and updates. As we reflect upon 33 years of our operating history, we pose to note our valuable relationship and partnership with the Alberta government and the, and the Alberta Health Services, and the Alberta Health Services predecessors, the Calgary Regional Health Authority and the Calgary Health Region. With its forward and progressive thinking, it was in 1996 that the province of Alberta pursued outsourcing of surgical services into the community. For all 25 years, we have always remained partners having different contracts, and we have built great relationships with Alberta Healthcare and, and Alberta Health Services. 2021 is particularly significant because it is the silver anniversary of our first partnership contract with the Calgary Regional Health Authority. This is longer than most matrimonial relationships in Canada. Interestingly also, our first contract was for ophthalmology services. Multiple studies have shown outsourcing allows increased capacity in hospitals and for other services. Independent clinics run efficiently with increased throughput, are cost effective and very safe, resulting in good results. Based on this successful model, various other health regions in Canada have visited our facility and emulated this template and even taken it to the next level of outsourcing many different surgical specialities. SCI or surgical centers has been a partner with other health authorities in other provinces also. The commitment of the Alberta government to launch the Alberta Surgical Initiative is to be commended and we are proud to be a partner. This initiative will reduce wait times for surgery, increase capacity in the hospitals, and improve patient care, access, and also save money. On behalf of all the surgical centers, I commend Minister Chandra and the government of Alberta on keeping its election promise, promise and launching the Alberta Sur Surgical Initiative. I also take this opportunity to thank all our staff from the corporate level to the people on the, in the ORs and in the administration uh, for their valuable work, especially during this COVID outbreak and trying to keep the places running and as effectively and efficiently as possible. Thank you. Okay, we'll now go to the phones. Uh, we'll have time for one question and one follow-up today. Operator, could you please put through the first question? question is Lisa Johnson with Post Media. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, this question is for Minister Shandro. Um, last year in July, the government put out a call for proposals for a third party to review its pandemic response during the first wave, um, with the point being to help the province better respond to a potential second wave. It was originally set to be 
finished in the fall, but obviously in December we learned that it was delayed until sometime in 2021. Um, do you know what the new deadline is for this review, when are Albertans going to see it? And given the fact that we're now well into the second wave, what value is there in this review going forward? No, fantastic question, Lisa. Um, so I understand that the uh, the, uh, the organization that was contracted to to do the review of the pandemic response has finished a, a first draft. I think they will be making the the final submission fairly soon, and we will be then after reviewing it, making that public. Um, the um, I, I, but we also wanted to move quickly, and there's much to be learned as well in in 2020. Um, I think uh, I assume that one of the the recommendations will be that we continue to to learn from from COVID and, and our response to the pandemic. This is a, a new situation that every country, every jurisdiction, uh, is is going through, and will continue to learn and having to react quickly to to this pandemic and and future ones as well. And so it's going to be important for us to not just take this uh, what we learned from from the the folks who provided this report or will be providing that report, but also continuing to to learn from anything we learn in the future from, from COVID-19 and beyond. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, okay, so there's no specific deadline. Can you tell me what specifically are the parameters for the review? Uh, are they the same as they were in July or have they been expanded or limited in any way? I'm, I'm not aware of the, the parameters being expanded at all. I, my assumption would be cause, uh, that the, the, the parameters would have, and the scope would have stayed the same. Um, as you said, the uh, the timing of them being able to finish their their draft and the report was affected by COVID itself. Um, but I understand that the uh, the vendor will be uh, very soon being able to have their final draft submitted to us, and then we at that time, after review, we, we will be making that public. Thanks, Lisa. Operator, could you put through the next caller? Next is Jason Herring with Post Media. Go ahead, Jason. Hi, this question is for the minister. Uh, you talked a little bit about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine authorization off the top, but I'm wondering if there's any info you can provide on when we might have more details about shipments. I mean, is it, is it fair to say if this new approval will further accelerate the timeline you provided yesterday? of uh, first doses for all who want them by the end of July? I assume it will. As you said, I mean, it's another vaccine that's been approved, but we have been provided today, because the approval just happened this morning, we've been provided no, um, no information about shipments or amounts from the federal government for the, the Janssen or, or the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. So we look forward to getting that information from the federal government so that we can plan accordingly and uh, understand uh, how, many more, how many more vaccines we'll be able to provide to Albertans. Jason, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a few aspects of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that make it a bit easier than other jabs to uh, distribute and administer uh, single dose sort of refrigerator temperature. Um, just wondering what kind of discussions are ongoing in, in deciding which groups will receive this vaccine. Thanks. And Jason, we haven't received that, uh, those recommendations from Dr. Hinshaw and the, the Alberta Vaccine um, uh, um, Advisory Committee that we have here in Alberta on, on how... I haven't even seen the monograph myself, I have to admit. I think we did get some information from the federal government this morning, but I don't think it included the monograph. I may be wrong. Um, so we, I look forward to being able to review that monograph, getting the advice of Dr. Hinshaw and the, the Vaccine Advisory Committee and understanding which, uh, which folks in, in phase two we might be able to provide this to. And, and you are right, um, the, the fact that it is one dose and the fact that like AstraZeneca, it can be stored between two and six degrees, does make it easier for us logistically to distribute and administer. Thank you. Operator, could you please put through the next question? Next is Jesse Wisner with Global TV. Go ahead, Jesse. Hi, Minister. Um, I'm wondering how yesterday's announcement about the June 30th timeline for first vaccine doses will affect summer events. Uh, like what percentage of Albertan adults needs to be vaccinated to make a difference for large scale events? And kind of more generally, this being uh, the year anniversary, what are your hopes for the summer after a very long year? 
Well, I'll answer in reverse order. My hopes uh, are high for this summer, as probably every Albertans is. Uh, I, I think we're all looking forward to um, to, a, to a summer, as I said earlier as well, that this isn't just light at the other, other end of the tunnel. This is the other end of the tunnel now that we can see. So this is fantastic news for us. Um, we, and it's, you know, how, what percentage of Albertans being vaccinated has never been a benchmark for us. But of course, fewer, you know, more people getting vaccinated means, um, I, we can all assume that our, our hospitalizations will continue to come down, but also maybe even more importantly, as our hospitalizations have come down and the, the increase in, in cases that we saw in the last week, that 8% increase in uh, the weekly average of cases, um, we won't see those increase in cases as more people uh, take the vaccine, as we have that uptake. I, I think we're getting great feedback from, from those who are in priority groups in, in one and, and two for, um, for uh, it's indicating great uptake for us here in Alberta, which will, will mean that we'll have fewer people in hospitals, fewer cases, and those are the, the metrics that we're going to be using as we move through into step three and the step four. And just a reminder that uh, I, my memory is that the, the summer festivals would be um, uh, aligned with um, what would be available in step four. So we look forward to, to continuing on, on this trajectory. As I said, this is not just the light at the end of the tunnel, but the other end of the tunnel. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, so as a follow-up, if uh, what, if any, restrictions could be in place if we make that June 30th timeline? Um, are we expected to be in step four uh, around that date? Well, I, I'm not going to say that we expect it. I, I mean, we, we have planned these three-week windows in between each of these steps. So if our, uh, if our hospitalizations get down to 150 um, after a three-week window before uh, step three, then, then yes, then we will be in step four. Um, that's that's what we're we're planning on. Um, there, you're right to to point out that that's not to say that we might not have still have some restrictions, like social distancing and hygiene, and uh, masking in in places like hospitals, in continuing care, um, perhaps easing of, of measures that might be related to to visitors in continuing care. But we will still continue to look at the effects the vaccine has not just on severe outcomes we've talked about before dr hinshaw and i that there's three ways for us to judge the effectiveness of a vaccine it's its effects on the severe outcomes for somebody who gets a vaccine the effect that it has on uh, preventing uh, infection asymptomatic infection as well in particular as well as it's the way that it works in preventing transmission and so it's that last piece that affects the population as a whole and when we have a large-scale event like a, a summer festival we'll have to look at how the uptake of vaccines are helping us prevent transmission and how it's affecting the population as a whole Offer, operator could you put through the next question please next is mark zamani with ctv calgary go ahead mark Heather, this is a question for the Minister. Uh, you mentioned that uh, all adults will be able to uh, be eligible for that COVID vaccine at the end of June, but still a large uh, population when it comes to children that aren't eligible. Um, does the province have any plans for the rollout of vaccines for children? Uh, they do represent, I believe, 19% of the total population here in the province, and uh, we want to reach that herd immunity, so they would be essential to, uh, to reaching that if we vaccinated them as well. It's a fantastic question, Mark. I think the, the answer, though, is, is found in, in the research that was done in the phase three trials for all these vaccines, the vaccine candidates, that as the, the world and all these manufacturers and the scientists throughout the, the globe had, had rushed to be able to get vaccines uh, approved um, in, in various jurisdictions across the globe as they did so. And they went through phase three trials. We don't yet have a, enough information um, because we, we didn't, I, my understanding is the manufacturers didn't include children in those phase three trials. Now that we have had a lot of um, approvals of uh, these first four in Canada in particular, uh, vaccines will continue to look at the research with Dr. Henshaw, get her advice and the advice of the vaccine advisory committee. It's an advisory committee of, of scientists and doctors to be able to give us the advice on if and when we can provide these vaccine vaccine candidates to people who are under the age of 18. Thanks, Mark. Mark, did you have a follow-up? No, nope, that's good. Thank you. Okay, operator, please put through the next question. Next is 
Tom Ross with 660 News. Go ahead, Tom. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any plans on how uh, people will be able to um, make appointments for uh, vaccinations once you open it up for the, the much wider public, as we saw some issues technically with the online booking program. Is it going to be a similar sort of thing or just kind of, you know, go to a pharmacy and book it yourself or something like that? And as, as we announced yesterday that we will, um, and we've done a few things actually, I should point out to, to help with uh, any of the issues that, that happened with those who are in, were in phase 1B. Um, we had a, a rush of, um, I think, 150,000 people who were trying to get um, appointments in that, even in the first hour alone. Um, so we, we are staging uh, people who are eligible in, by, um, by smaller age uh, cohorts, for, for example, for phase two. That might be something we do as well for phase three. Um, we, we haven't made any decisions regarding phase three and the, how the, the rollout is, is provided to the, the wider public who are not included in phase two. Um, we haven't had any recommendations from Dr. Henshaw this time and, and whether and how those, uh, the rest of the population might be broken down. Um, but you're, you're right to point out that the um, onboarding of pharmacies, the first 102 has been also allowed us to um, offload a lot of that volume and, and stress in the, the booking systems for, for AHS and the booking of appointments. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to continuing to have more pharmacies as well as our family doctors. Uh, we're, we're going to have our family physicians and, and other physicians able to provide the vaccines. That will also allow people to make uh, appointments with them as well. Now, uh, the details of, of how the appointments for, for people in the community, uh, pharmacies and family physicians might be able to provide those, those vaccines. We're continuing to, to work with those community partners to see how that, that might, um, we can continue to work with them and uh, to, to change the, the registration system for the vaccines, but we have nothing decided yet at this time, Tom. Tom, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just to quickly to build on that, is there any more progress on getting uh, family doctors involved in this? There has been. So we've reached out to, to physicians through the, the AMA, making sure that they understood that we want to include them in the, uh, the vaccine rollout. So there has been an expression of interest that has gone out. Um, the, the ministry has received some information from those family physicians and working with onboarding them and making sure that uh, we have a, a reporting system as well so that we know uh, which Albertans are, are getting vaccinated and the numbers of, of folks who are getting vaccinated, which vaccines they're, they're receiving, uh, so that we can make sure we provide that transparency and disclosure to the, to the wider public and people can see that information. So it's, it seems like it's going uh, quite well with the, the family physicians, uh, but nothing new to announce today, though. Thanks, Tom. Okay, we have time for three more questions. Operator, could you please put through the next caller? Next is Kat Dennison with CBC Radio. Go ahead, Kat. Hi, thank you. And uh, my question is actually going to be in French, so a little interruption here for uh, François Bélanger. Um, alors, uh, je voulais juste un petit peu parler. Je sais que le chiffre estimé de presque 17 000 uh, interventions reportées a été quand même assez alarmant pour certaines personnes. Est-ce que vous pouvez parler brièvement du plan d'attaque de l'échéancier Pour attraper les chirurgies aussi, j'aimerais savoir si vous avez été capable d'estimer quel nombre de ces chirurgies étaient vraiment essentielles. Oui, merci pour la question. Alors, nous avons eu, un, un, nous avons été obligés de reporter un nombre de, de chirurgies pour la, la première vague de COVID. Et puis, euh, le, alors, le, 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 Tous ceux qui ont été euh, reportés à cause de la première vague de, de COVID ont été leur chirurgie, leur, leur chirurgie ils ont eu l'opportunité d'avoir la chirurgie euh, euh, d'être complétée. Alors, tous ceux, tous ceux qui ont été à partir de la vague numéro un sont complétés. Évidemment, il y a, il y a des gens qui s'accumulent au cours de l'année parce que nous n'avons pas atteint encore euh, un 100 de notre, euh, de notre activité qui était au, au, avant, avant, avant COVID. Et puis, nous avons subi également euh, des délais de chirurgie à partir de la, la deuxième vague de COVID. 
Alors, nous avons euh, des stratégies que nous avons en place. C'est les stratégies que nous avons décrites aujourd'hui euh, d'augmenter le nombre de chirurgies à travers notre Chartered Surgical Facilities. Et puis, euh, nous faisons ça avec le, ceux qui ont, avec le, nos, 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 nos partenaires que nous avons présentement. Et puis, nous regardons également à développer de nouveaux partenaires, particulièrement pour euh, d'autres chirurgies comme orthopédie. Et puis, ça, c'est la première, les, 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 les deux de nos, de nos stratégies. Notre autre stratégie que nous avons décrit aujourd'hui, c'est de, de, de créer des sites qui sont, euh, 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 qui sont protégés euh, euh, et qui nous permettent d'augmenter de, de, le nombre de chirurgies quand d'autres centres ou d'autres facilités, euh, d'autres euh, hôpitaux euh, vont être affectés par la COVID. Et nous prévoyons faire, euh, au, nous avons commis euh, au ministre de faire euh, 55 000 euh, chirurgies additionnelles au cours de la, première, de la prochaine année fiscale, ce qui nous mettrait dans de très bonnes positions euh, pour, euh, 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 pour finalement, euh, le, pour, pour ce que nous avons commis à partir d'Alberta de, de, Surgical Initiative. Merci beaucoup. Kat, do you have a follow-up? Oui, OK, thank you. OK. Uh, operator, could you please put through the next caller? Next is Kevin Nimick with CTV Calgary. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi there, a question for the minister. I'd just like to follow up on the question Mark, Mark asked earlier regarding kids. Is it possible to go back to some version of pre-pandemic normal without kids being vaccinated? Well, that may be a, a question um, that um, I'll have to defer to, to Dr. Henshaw to, to answer. Um, we, I think, so a couple of things. I think we can we can remember that the as adults and more and more adults are um, have uptake in, in accepting the the vaccines, and we have fewer fewer people in hospitals. Um, that's been our, our key metric as we move into step two, step three, step four. Um, we know that the average age of folks who are in a hospital is 60. So a lot of people in their 50s, a lot of people in their 60s. Um, as, as adult Albertans are continuing to get those vaccinations, then the stress on our hospital system isn't going to, to be as, um, as, uh, as concerning as it had been in the fall and is right now. And uh, if that's our key metric, if we know that we can, as a, as a system, handle uh, 150 people in hospital beds for COVID without there being a concern, if it's there or less, then um, you know, whether there's transmission among children and uh, by you know, some rare circumstances, children to an adult, if, uh, if the adult hasn't received a vaccine, it's not going to be as, as widespread and a concern if the uptake among adult Albertans is, is there. Um, I also say this, and, and I'll leave it for, for Dr. Hinshaw to, to clarify, um, but um, we have, have heard many times from her as we open up the schools that her concern wasn't in transmission from children to teachers in, in the schools, that her concern in the schools was, was always transmission from teacher to teacher, adult to adult, in particular in the staff room. So um, there, there, are, there can be transmission from, from obviously, from, from children to adults. Um, but uh, I'll continue to get her advice and would defer uh, any technical uh, answers regarding your question about um, to the extent to which children have to, to be immunized for us to be able to see more uh, reduction in the transmission in the community. Kevin, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, sure do. Minister, it's, as you said, it's been a year since COVID was announced to be in our province. If you were stepping in a time machine, and could go back to the start of the pandemic, what would you personally do differently? Um, uh, I'd, probably every government's asking that. It was part of the reason why we did the review um, uh, of the, the response to the pandemic. Um, I think that we, we focused on, at the very beginning, make sure that we expanded our testing capacity as, as uh, largely and robustly as we could and, and made sure that we, we procured enough um, PPE to make sure that we were able to respond and um, equip our medical professionals or healthcare professionals throughout the pandemic. So we responded very quickly there. Um, and we made sure that we expanded our, our system capacity as well and our surgical capacity throughout the, the response to the pandemic as well. Um, this is, um, of course, we saw some cases and we saw a, a wave in the fall. Uh, we continue to make sure that our, our measures, Kevin, have been targeted and narrow and based on, on the evidence of where that transmission has been occurring so that we can balance lives and livelihoods, balance the social and the economic consequences of them. 
um, whether there are, are ways for us to have further refined it. We've, we've learned throughout the pandemic, though, Kevin. We've, we've continued to refine our response to the pandemic as we learn, not even just every month, but every day, to make sure that our response is continuing to learn from even the previous day, let alone the previous year. And we'll continue to do that so that we make sure that AHS and the ministry have all the resources that it needs to make sure that people get the care that they need throughout the pandemic. Okay, operator, could you put through our last question? Final question is Ashley Joanna with Post Media Edmonton. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, good afternoon. This is a question for the minister. When you first announced much of this wait time and surgical information back in September, you said that a formal request for proposals for new chartered facilities is coming out in the fall of 2020. Now, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the RFP is coming out in the spring. Is, is this the same RFP that was supposed to come out in 2020, and, and what caused the delay? It is the same one. It was COVID. COVID delayed it. Part of it was, as we saw, um, and we worked with AHS, to make sure that we were, we started by listening to other provinces say that they, it was going to take them two years to catch up on the backlog of surgeries that were postponed or canceled in the spring of 20. And while we decreased our surgical capacity, I think the lowest point it got in the spring was about 40% of our pre-COVID surgical capacity. Other provinces like Ontario got down to about 10% at, at their worst moment. Um, we didn't want that to be the case, taking two years to catch up on that backlog. We worked, worked with AHS to make sure that it wasn't going to be the case here in Alberta. We got back to about 90% 90, 90 of that backlog was caught up in the, the summer, but we knew that there would be a potential for a, a further wave of, of transmission in, um, in our community, and we needed to make sure that AHS was prepared for that capacity to make sure that we didn't have any reduction in surgery. So part of that was going to the existing 43 chartered surgical facilities that we have in the province right now and, and others to be able to renegotiate new volumes for them during COVID and during 2020. As we went back to them to negotiate that we can't have a, an RFP during that period of time. So we very quickly during the, uh, the early fall and, and the summer renegotiated those volumes to, uh, to be able to have, uh, make sure we didn't have any concerns with, with postponement here in Alberta. And that did postpone, it was one of the reasons why we did have a postponement in, in this RFP process, but happy that we are able to get it out now. It's our commitment to, uh, and a big part of our commitment to uh, getting our, our uh, surgical wait times down to what we promised Albertans they would be. Ashley, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, so now that you've had more time to think about this RFP and, and put it together, do you have a better sense of exactly how many more um, surgical chartered facilities that you're hoping will be opened through this RFP? Well, we're, we're actually thinking of it the other way around. We're actually thinking of it as the number of surgeries. We, we, we know what we want our wait times to be. And we know how many Albertans they are. We know how many procedures there are going to be for um, every permutation of surgery in a given year and how they're going to increase over the next uh, few years and in the coming decade. So if we work backwards from there, how many more surgeries do we need on top of the, the 290,000 that are done in, in the next year? And we realize it had to be 55,000. So our goal isn't necessarily how many surgical facilities we have in the province. It's how do we get to 55,000 surgeries? Uh, we have been, as we announced in the fall though, um, been including our Indigenous communities as well and providing opportunities for them to make sure that they can um, have an opportunity to have a, a successful application as well to the RFP. Uh, and so Six Nations did um, uh, qualify for, for that grant to, to help them with, uh, with that process. Um, but uh, we, we work backwards, if that makes any sense, in, in looking at the volume of surgeries rather than the number of facilities. Thank you. That concludes today's media event. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone.